G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for today's video, which is going to be taking a look back at the predictions I did at the start of the year, uh, where I predicted all 18 teams from 18th to 1st, uh, and all the award winners that usually do that every year. Uh, today's video is going to be looking back at just how poorly I went in that video by comparing it to the actual final ladder. Always feel very, very exposed doing these videos, but, but I'm going to obviously have a crack at it anyway. I remember last year, I think the biggest howler I had was I tipped the dogs to slide out of the eight and then ended up making the grand final, of course. And then in this year, I think I've, uh, at least on two occasions, probably got two even worse calls than that. So uh, we'll get straight into it. How the format of the video will go is that uh, in the original video, I tipped it from 18th all the way down to first. So we'll sort of go team by team in the prediction. I'll show the clip from earlier in the year, do a little reaction to it and slowly move down the teams and uh, give you a little bit of a comment as to why I had such a horrible prediction. As always guys, this video is sponsored by manscaped.com. I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a secret here. Since I got back from Europe, I uh, hadn't shaved my chest since Barcelona. So I reckon we're going on about two months now now and uh, my chest was really hairy I didn't want to admit that on camera because you know I'm sponsored by Manscaped but I've been lazy and uh, you know I think part of it was my body was looking terrible from a month drinking beers and eating burgers constantly as well so finally getting my act together I did the full body shave and to be honest with you using the lawnmower 4.0 I'm no BS took about eight minutes I reckon um, so it is a very very impressive tool for you to highlight your own impressive tool so don't forget you can get 20% off and free shipping on all of Manscaped's products if you simply Simply use the code TRUEFOOTY20 at checkout. That's 20% off and free shipping. Let's get into the video. So I'll start rolling the clips from earlier in the year and here we go. So starting at the bottom of the ladder, I am going to go with Collingwood here. And the reason for that is fairly simple. I think it's clear that they're in quite a rebuild mode. They're a pretty top heavy list. The top end quality is really good. It's the layer below that that concerns me a little bit. And they've done a really good job of cycling through some young talent. They've hit the draft hard the last couple of years. On that logic, I think they're just going to have a year where the kids are going to get a lot of games and they're going to struggle to be competitive. Factor in the new coach as well, where the expectations are fairly low. I think McRae's want to get this rebuild right. And thus, I think, it's going to be a long-term view at Collingwood this year. All right, in 18th spot, we have uh, the absolute worst howler for, for first up. In fact, I don't know if it's clearly the worst. There is another bad one coming up, but we'll talk about Collingwood first. I remember seeing my face on TikTok quite a bit um, because I presume Collingwood fans had uh, sort of highlighted all the YouTubers who predicted Collingwood to do shit this year, so I, I've already been roasted plenty for this. But obviously, Collingwood ended up finishing fourth. I completely misread where their list was at. I thought, you know, having finished 17th last year, they'd go through a bit of a list refresh with a new coach, but completely exceeded my expectations even though I would argue that a new coach has a bit more license to play the kids I had no idea just how hard they'd bounce back and as I said in my defense they did finish 17th last year it's not like I predicted a top four team to finish bottom two and then they finished top four again they surprised everyone this year but yeah horrible call by me 17th we're gonna go with the Gold Coast Suns and this is a bit of a an easy one just because people always notoriously expect Gold Coast to finish low on the ladder and to be fair they're usually right Stewie Jew's in the last year of his contract and it's a big year for him, so he's going to want to see some genuine improvement. But for me, it's just hard to make a case for that improvement coming. They had Ben King really make a name for himself last year. He looks like one of the best young key forward talents in the competition and now he's out with an ACL. And He was generally an important avenue to goal for them last year. So I know they're talking about Lukosius going forward, but if you take out one of their primary goal kickers, in fact, their best goal kicker, as much as you can see the young midfield coming on, like Rao will come back into the side. I think Anderson showed some really good signs last year amongst others. If they're struggling to kick goals, then I don't think they're going to finish very high on the ladder, to be honest. And I, I can see them having that typically good start to the year and then falling away poorly. So for me, still not enough experience on the list to back them any higher than 17th. So I had the Gold Coast Suns in second last and their actual finish was 12th on the ladder. This was their equal best ever season. So I, I really didn't have enough faith in the Gold Coast Suns. And, you know, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who felt that way. That being said, still got this, uh, I would say, fairly wrong. Five spots I underrated them by. And I really thought that the loss of Ben King would be an important avenue to goal. Turns out Gold Coast improved massively even despite the loss of Ben King. So well done, the Suns. In 16th, I've got the Adelaide Football Club who finished last in 2020. I think second last last year so they're going to move up one spot this year and I just think the reality is they've still got a bit to go in terms of their rebuild I think the reality is they're going to have a lot of kids to to get games into and I think they drafted well Rochelle looks like an absolute star that Saligo guy looked pretty good as well and they've also traded in Jordan Dawson but I don't think it's enough to see them rise up the ladder when Adelaide are good they are really good but it's obviously few and far between at this stage being such a young side so they may bob up and win a few upsets but I still have them in the bottom four 
So then I had Adelaide in 16th, uh, who actually finished 14th on the ladder. Of course, I did think that their loss of experience last year would sort of, you know, set them back a little bit. Obviously, there's a process here where lists get younger, they get a little bit less competitive, but they really impressed me with uh, how competitive they were this year and their consistency of effort really set them above the other rebuilding teams. And I would argue they are still a rebuilding team. I wasn't that far off the mark, only two spots, but they were slightly better than I anticipated. Rounding out the bottom four, and it's a pretty uncontroversial bottom four, to be honest. I'm going to go with North Melbourne, a team that people are picking to improve this year. And to be fair, I've still got them in the bottom four, but they did finish last last year. So if they climb three or four spots, that is still actually pretty acceptable improvement, in my opinion. They had some injury woes last year. You had some important experience players miss a lot of football with McDonald, Cunnington, Jed Anderson, Aiden Core, to name a few. They've also continued a bit of a clean out with guys like Atlee, Dumont, and Tarrant leaving the club over the off season. So again, like the other teams I mentioned, just a team that's got a lot of young kids to give games to. I think they had a really good offseason. They added Hugh Greenwood, Callum Coleman-Jones, and of course the number one pick, Jason Horn francis amongst their other draft picks as well. But just like the Crows, I think they'll bob up and have a few good wins, but ultimately too young to really push higher than bottom four. So I had the eventual wooden spooners in North Melbourne. I had them as high as 15th, and this was obviously a little bit too generous because North Melbourne were horrible this year. I thought on the back of their late season improvement in 2021, they would take that form into this year, but they uh, took a massive step backwards and I've said it all year but North and West Coast are way worse than the next worst teams in the competition it was a woeful year on and off the field they obviously lost their coach and probably lucky to have one of the two wins they did because they played an Eagles team that had top ups and you know that was just a horrible horrible game as I said that far off the next few worst sides and uh, yeah I was a little bit too generous with North Melbourne I'm going to start with Hawthorne find them really really hard to play so I think they've got a good mature midfield Tom Mitchell you know returned to some of his best form last year I thought he was really good I think their back line is actually their strength and you're adding Sicily to guys like GF Day and Scrimshaw as well so I really really rate Sam Mitchell as an Eagles fan and so many Eagles fans are big fans of Sam Mitchell and the impact he had here I think he's going to be a fantastic coach I just find it hard to peg exactly how they're going to go in his first season so I think they could play finals, but I'm going to hedge my bets and say probably 14th-ish. So I had Hawthorne in 14th, and they eventually finished 13th on the ladder. So I'll kind of give myself a tick for this one. I got it more or less right. I suggested that they could play finals, so probably a little bit more optimistic than I probably should have been. I hedged my bets, and I said 14th on the ladder. They did slightly better than this, but realistically, they were never really in the finals mix this year. Next up, in 13th, I'm going to go with my beloved West Coast Eagles. And again, I'm so unsure of where to place us, to be honest. I really don't want to feed into the negative narrative in the media at the moment that, you know, we, we got trounced in the first preseason game and the injuries are starting to pile up and then there's Darling. I, I tend to think we kind of get caught in a loop of negative media sort of attention and we're probably underrating West Coast a little bit. I include myself in that because I really hope we're going to finish higher than 13th and I do think we can play finals to be honest. The injuries have been well documented. I think they're a little bit over-reported. We are going to get a fair few of those players back in the first month of the season where we've got a relatively easy run. So I'm still quite optimistic in that sense. What they need to do is find average news to go through guys like Waterman and Allen and I think those guys could bob up for you know 30 35 goal seasons I then predicted the Eagles to finish in 13th and they finished in second last this year in 17th on the ladder I obviously got this wrong I'm always going to be a bit of an optimist when it comes to the Eagles I'm afraid I think since this channel has started other than 2018 I've predicted them to finish higher than they eventually did so I'm probably going to keep doing that into uh, eternity but to be fair to the Eagles they did have all of the worst luck this year now, don't get me wrong, the football was dreadful. They were a putrid team this year, and yeah, it wasn't really clear who was better out of them and North Melbourne. I'd argue the Eagles sort of improved a bit more in the last little part of the year, but the injury situation that I highlighted in that video it never improved. We're the only team that needed top-ups, and we needed them twice this year as well. I overrated Waterman badly, as you can see, and uh, Oscar Allen, I also mentioned that video, and he didn't play a single game. There was heaps of players that just never came in into the side, unfortunately. That being said, injury wasn't necessarily the, the main factor in this year. It was, uh, it was every single thing that could have gone wrong went wrong, and the injuries didn't help. So either way, we sucked. Next, we've got the Saints, another team that is very, very hard to place, and I'm probably underrating them a little bit this year. Could they do a sort of Melbourne-like revival where they bounce out of finals and then back in dramatically? Probably would say they don't quite have the same upside as a Melbourne did 12 months ago, but that doesn't mean they can't play finals, and they are well and truly in that sort of group of finals aspirants. Last year, it fell apart badly for them. I think fitness and injuries were largely a factor. They certainly weren't the only team that that happened to, but they kind of put in both terrific 
terrific performances in some games and really, really horrific performances. Some of their worst performances, much like West Coast last year. Long story short, I find it hard to place them, but I'm going to place them below some of these other finals aspirants. I had St. Kilda 12th, who eventually finished 10th, which is obviously me slightly underrating them. I did have them in the right group of teams on the ladder, although they slightly exceeded my expectations, I guess. What I didn't really see coming was the fact that they were 8-3 and three at the bye, uh, and they fell away badly in the second half of the year to eventually miss finals, of course, and now it's culminated in the loss of their coach. So obviously a huge swing and a miss from St. Kilda this year. They're capable of more, and I think that's why they sacked their coach, uh, but I'm unsure what the next little period of time looks like for St. Kilda. They're a team that I always find it hard to peg, uh, although in this case, I was only two spots off. Next up in 11th, this is going to be an unpopular one, but I'm going to put Essendon here just because I feel like they might just get leapfrogged this year. I think they took big strides last year, but there's absolutely no doubt about that. The way their midfield stepped up, led by Darcy Parrish, getting all the way to the finals and putting in some really good performances along the way. And I, I just, I feel like their youth is outstanding, some of their youth anyway, but whether or not it's ready to take the next step to support guys like Parrish who stepped up last year, look, maybe they, they could definitely play finals. But let's be honest, it was a pretty weak sort of top eight race last year. And will they improve enough against the competition to make finals again? Maybe, but I'm probably not going to bet on it. On the plus side, I think Peter Wright has been a fantastic acquisition for them. And if he bobs up and plays a regular role up forward and, you know, kicks 35 to 40 goals, they're probably going to play finals again. For me, I reckon it's probably a year of stagnation and then watch out for them in 2023. I then had Essendon in 11th and uh, they actually finished 15th. I thought that they wouldn't improve against the rest of the competition. I felt some other teams would improve. And while I got that part right, Essendon did fall away this year. In my justification, I thought that if Wright had a big year and if he kicked 35 goals, they would make the finals. He kicked 53 and they were absolutely nowhere near it. So that shows how far away, you know, the rest of the team were this year. It's not the end of the world for them. I think they've got a good base of talent, maybe need to add some top end talent, but we'll see how Brad Scott goes in the new role. In 10th spot, I've got the Richmond Tigers who of course fell away with injury poorly in 2021, of course being reigning premiers that year. It is very hard to bet against the side with Dusty in it and he had that bloody kidney laceration last year as well. So it wasn't just Dusty that missed football though. It had a whole heap of players miss and I think they really missed someone like Noah Bolter in the back half of that year, but they have recruited Robbie Tarrant to sort of come in and also replace David Asprey. On paper, I don't really rate their midfield to be honest. I think that's an area they really, really need to recruit for and from all reports they tried to last year. I think it will be a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde season for Richmond where some games they trounce a contender and then other games they look listless. So that's why I don't have them higher than 10th. So I had Richmond 10th and they actually finished 7th going out in week one of the finals, which is obviously underrating them a little bit. I did identify that they had a little bad injury run the previous year, but I didn't back them in as much as I should have to bounce up the ladder. I highlighted the midfield as a weakness in that side, but it didn't stop them making finals. And now they've obviously recruited heavily in that part of the ground. So uh, look out for them in 2023. In ninth spot, cruelly missing out in finals. This is a spot nobody wants to finish in. And that's of course where the Eagles finished last year, but I've got the Carlton footy club and Based on logic rather than gut feel, they, they need to improve, surely. It's certainly the most mature and well-rounded 22 I've seen from Carlton in a number of years, and two big recruits in Adam Chera and George Hewitt, who I think has been going pretty well in the preseason. Then, of course, there's the form of Patrick Cripps, and if he comes good, then that really elevates them to a genuine finals contender. But I'm starting to see the midfield take shape. You've got Cripps, Walsh, Chera, and Hewitt amongst the other guys that they have already have. Then you've got Mackay up forward, who is the reigning Coleman medalist, and Kerno back into the side. Fingers crossed he gets a good run at it. It's not a fully formed side, but for me on paper, it's definitely finals quality. So I can see them going close, but ultimately I have them just outside the eight. Carlton in ninth was the one prediction that I got absolutely bang on. Um, and maybe maybe the way I foresaw it happening wasn't quite right. But either way, Carlton in ninth, exactly where they finished. I felt at the time of that video that, you know, approaching this year, they were getting close to the finished article, but probably just still needed to consolidate that depth. We know about their top end talent. And I argued that it would be a bit of a development year, I guess, for them. Uh, and that more or less is the case. However, they started the year, I think it was eight and two. And similar to St. Kilda, missed the finals at the last gasp. So... I didn't see that coming, but either way, I'll take the win. I don't get a lot of these right. I'm going to say Fremantle slide into the eight this year. For me, the biggest obstacle for Fremantle is their injuries. It's been their massive Achilles heel, no pun intended, over the last you know three or four years. Have they been a finals-like side over the last few years? I think fair to say no, even considering the injuries. But you're starting to see a real game plan take shape under Justin Longmuir, and the way they move the ball albeit in sort of low pressure conditions, uh, has been pretty impressive this off season. So they've generally got good rebound in guys like Hayden Young, Jordan Clark, Luke Ryan, someone like Heath Chapman bobbed up in the preseason game as 
as well. So he looks like he could become our best 22 player very, very quickly. I'm a big fan of their midfielders in Brayshaw and Sarong, and it's probably just for them finding reliable avenues to go. It's kind of a hole in their list they haven't quite plugged yet. Tapena is well and truly capable of kicking 40, 45 snags a year, and I do like the mix with their small forwards in Schultz and Switkowski. It really gives them a different dynamic up forward. I think they're going to be hard enough to beat at home this year where they're good enough to play finals. I think it's pretty 50-50 at this stage, but I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to I'm gonna lock in Fremantle. So I had Fremantle scraping into finals in eighth spot, and they exceeded that by finishing fifth this year. I did buy in slightly to the Fremantle buzz in the preseason. They had a couple of good wins, uh, which I argued didn't count for much, and maybe that's still true. I don't think those games count for much. But either way, Fremantle had a fantastic year in terms of their improvement. I didn't anticipate how quickly they would improve, and I certainly didn't expect them to knock off some big dogs uh, in Melbourne this year. Obviously, they beat Melbourne, they beat the eventual Premier's Geelong, uh, and there's some other impressive wins along that as well. I'm happy enough with the prediction. They exceeded my expectations, but you know they were kind of a relatively ballsy tip for finals, uh, so I'll kind of give myself a tick for that. In seventh spot, slightly stagnating, I've got the Sydney Swans, another one that people are sort of picking for the top four, and gee, may maybe they're right. Not really staking a massive claim that I think that they're going to you know stagnate, but it wouldn't be surprising considering you know how young that team is, and it's rare that a young team who has a really great year is always able to back it up the following year. Last year, they looked at times like one of the best teams in the competition. I think people were saying they had the best game plan or at least the most attractive style. I wouldn't be surprised if opposition teams do their homework on how to stop Sydney. So I had the Swans in seventh and they eventually finished third and of course made the grand final before getting absolutely pummeled. I just felt that, you know, with the young list and, you know, some other opposition sides looking at them a bit more intensely, I guess, in terms of, you know, their tactics and their game plan, which uh, I think stands out at AFL level. Uh, but you know what? They responded really well. That didn't happen at all this year. Uh, they certainly improved. They were under the radar for me and maybe some other people this year as well, all the way to the grand final. And they certainly exceeded my expectations. So with seventh, I criminally underrated them. They had a fantastic year. In a bit of an upset, I have got GWS in my top six, and I've probably been backing GWS far too long now. I think I just really rate their potential. They've got a good blend of, you know, established talent, ex elite established talent at that, and also some really good young kids that we kind of forget about a little bit because it's GWS and they always seem to have high picks, but, you know, some of the young talent they've recruited over the last few years, there's a lot of upside there. <laughs> this one, this one is actually arguably worse than the Collingwood one. GWS to finish six. That is just the unnecessarily ballsy prediction by me. They eventually finished 16th, so third last. And uh, I think they, I do think they grossly underachieved. Uh, hence the new coach, you know, obviously Leon Cameron's no longer at the helm, but even still, they were nowhere near it. This is absolutely one of my worst ever predictions that I thought GW was going to be good. I still think their list talent and their best 22 this year was nowhere near being the third worst side in the competition. And that's probably true for a few sides down that part of the ladder. Uh, so they had a horrible year and underdelivered on some talent, but either way, horrible call. So in fifth spot, just sliding out of the top four, I've got Port Adelaide, but again, a team that I could see winning the minor premiership. So much upside in that team. Yes, they rely on a couple of older blokes like Travis Boak in particular, who seems to be getting better with age somehow, but I do think they've got a really good mix of those younger 21, 22, 23 year old types who could really elevate them again this year. So I had the power in fifth spot and they eventually missed finals, of course, in 11th spot. I don't feel like beating myself up too much for this one, because I, again, I think this was a clear case of a team that's actually half decent that had a horrible start to the year and they never recovered. They were 0-5, inexplicably dropped off. They started to get their shit together in the second half of the year before ultimately uh, there was never really a good strong chance that they were in the finals hunt. So I don't think this is the end for them. I think this is a blip on the radar for them. But yeah, obviously I got this one wrong. They missed finals horribly. In the fourth spot, I'm going Geelong, and this is a boring one, and I think people like to see Geelong fall down ladder predictions because it seems almost inevitable, but I think, to be honest, it's still wishful thinking. They had a terrible end of the season last year. You can blame it on the flu or whatever Chris Scott shows. Maybe that's true, but regardless, this is a team that's so consistently good. They get home games in Geelong as well, where they're pretty hard to beat, and their best 22 just stacks up. They've still got Jeremy Cameron and Tom Hawkins as their two pillars up forward, and yes, I do think they could have done a better job of sort of facilitating a bit of a transition, like where, what does the team look like in three years? They haven't really invested in the youth, but I don't think it's going to affect them this year. I think they're going to be very hard to beat. And while I'm not as confident that they'll win the flag, I still think they're going to be competitive enough and win enough games to probably finish fourth or fifth. So I had the eventual premiers in Geelong who were runaway minor premiers and, uh, you know, one big in the grand final. I had them in fourth spot. So to some extent, I was felt like I was backing them in. There was a lot of criticism or at least um, some doubt about how Geelong were going to front up this year with an A 
aging list. We hear that every year and uh, I wasn't buying into it, but of course I still underrated them a little bit. I thought they would be in the mix for a flag before ultimately deciding that I didn't have enough faith in them to actually win the flag and they proved me wrong this year. So they had a great list. It's not a big surprise. Uh, so not a, not a tick for that one, but I certainly wouldn't beat myself up for that one. In third spot, we've got the Western Bulldogs who absolutely proved me wrong last year. To be honest, that was kind of me just trying to make a big call and uh, I really regret that. So this is a team that's really, really not far off the benchmark of the competition and at times were probably the best team for a couple of rounds here and there last year. It's a star-studded team with a really good age mix. They've had some really good young talents come into the side and there's still a lot of upside. You know, Sam Darcy was picked three or four. They had the number one pick last year. With their age demographic, it's hard to pick them sliding. They do have this tendency to miss the top four. They haven't done it since about 2010, despite playing in two grand finals and winning a flag, but their top football is absolutely premium. So it's hard to have them outside my top four. I've got them in third. So a year after having a horrible call for the dogs to slide and they exceed expectations, I have the dogs obviously pandering to their fans. I've picked them to finish third uh, and they eventually finished eighth and were a long way off the form they showed in 2021, let's be honest. So they still had a solid year, played finals, still had a good list, but it didn't. they didn't put it together enough on field at any point this year. Whereas, you know, in 2021, at times they look like the best side in the competition. With their finals form, you know, going into the final series, I did have some faith that they would, you know, pull out a typical Bulldogs finals run and potentially go deep. But I think the disappointing and poor finals showing against Fremantle, let's be honest, uh, was the uh, fitting full stop on a disappointing year. So missed opportunity, but they got a good enough list to go forward again in 2023. In second, I've got the Brisbane Lions. And again, I just can't back against them given their talent, their established talent sort of in the prime of their career. You're Lockie Neals, your Dane Zorkos. But again, like Port Adelaide, have this group of 21 to 23-year-olds who look like they could really come on and be elite players. In particular, Hugh McCluggage, Jared Berry had a great preseason game. Harris Andrews is still like 25 or 26. Cam Rain is coming back from injury. Zach Bailey and Brandon Stasevich are also nowhere near hitting their prime. The only knock on Brisbane is their finals performances, but they've proven to be a good home and away team. So I think this is the year they could finally go deep. Obviously, the knock on them has been their finals performances in the last few years, but it's an experienced team for a team carrying sort of a lot of younger players as well. So again, Brisbane will go deep this year. Second spot, I backed in the Brisbane Lions quite heavily and they eventually finished sixth and made a prelim. So it was a kind of a mixed year in terms of that. I'm big on their talent uh, and because of their form over the home and away seasons over the last couple of years, that was my justification for them, uh, you know, going high on the ladder again. And I backed them to do better in finals this time around. So I got half of that right. Their home and away form was worse, but they had a big scalp with a win over the Demons at the MCG. So it was a big step forward. They got to a prelim, uh, but they weren't as consistent this year. So we'll see what happens after a uh, big trade period to see how they go next year. And finally, we've got the Melbourne Football Club, who in reality were, you know, just an absolute tier above the rest of the competition last year. You wouldn't have thought it half time of the grand final, but the way they clicked into gear when the game was really there to be won just showed that they have that absolute champion mentality. And I don't really need to sell you on their list capability. Probably the best defense in the league, arguably the best midfield as well. And while their forward line probably doesn't have the, the established star power, there's still a lot of upside there. And when their midfield kicks as many goals as they do, it's hard to make a case that they're going to lack scoring power, particularly when they score 140 points in a grand final. For me, if I had sort of two vulnerabilities is with them. Of course, you got to cite hunger. Will this side be hungry enough to go again like they were in 2021? And I guess they lost Dan Burgess, their fitness coach, I believe, who has gone to the Adelaide Crows. And I'm not really saying this will have a genuine impact in the first season, but obviously one of the hallmarks of Melbourne's team last year was their ability to run out four quarters and push to the very end. So if that takes a hit, that could be a bit of a vulnerability for them, but I still think they're the best team in the comp and I can't have them any lower than first. And finally, uh, obviously the Demons was my pick to win the Premiership this year. They finished second on the ladder, so not a horrible call at all, but obviously going out in straight sets, they weren't really anywhere near their top form I'd, I'd argue at any point this year but certainly in finals that's where I expected them to come out strong and uh, they were really disappointing so I highlighted their vulnerabilities there were hunger and fitness potentially and it's hard to ascertain you know did I get that right or not it doesn't really matter at the end of the day they just couldn't quite show up when it mattered and unfortunately went out in straight sets but they'll be all right they'll be back next year Brown low medalist, I like to tip a tie. I think I tip a tie most years because it's just statistically it's due to happen and the chances are quite high. So I'm going to go with Clayton Oliver, who polled really well last year, and Jack Steele. 
Common medalist, I'm going to say Jeremy Cameron, if he can put together a full season, will be the common medalist, even with Tom Hawkins in that side. And the rising star, I'm going to go Nick Dacos, purely because I think he's probably going to play a lot of games for Collingwood. That, and he racked up 31 in a preseason game, so he obviously has no real trouble finding the ball. I know the intensity is going to be a bit different, but I think he'll play enough games, have that consistency. Maybe a Horn Francis spends a bit of time up forward for North, who knows? But I'm going to say Nick Dacos wins the rising star award. So for my award predictions, uh, Oliver ended up finishing fourth and Steele just polled 13 votes. So a uh, disappointing year in terms of brown low votes for him. Jeremy Cameron wasn't a bad pick for the Coleman. You're kind of just throwing darts at a dartboard uh, to some extent with the uh, Coleman medalist, but obviously Kerno won that. Uh, and I got the Rising Star right, although, you know, he was the raging favorite going into the season, so I won't claim that one too hard. Anyway, guys, that is me exposed. Don't go too hard on me. It's not as though I have a YouTube channel for five years and I'm trying to convince people I know much about football. I clearly don't, so <laughs> please unsubscribe. No, but in all seriousness, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, obviously, predictions are really hard, and I'm sure... Uh, I'll probably do a new predictions one, you know, before the end of the year. I like to do one before Christmas and uh, we get into the hardcore off season. So, um, yeah, go easy on me in this video. <laughs> go easy on me on the next one. Uh, I'm fragile. So, thanks guys for watching though. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.